resistance. Um, so first a word about the ideal primitive model. Uh, so it's used, we use it for proving security of hash functions or compression functions that depend on a smaller primitive. So we consider an information theoretic adversary who can query the smaller primitive and we just count the number of queries they make in order to break the constructions. They find a, a collision. So here, so the adversary is an information theoretic. The only problem is the randomness that comes out of these queries. So it can't predict what's going to happen. Um, so uh, we can take a look at an example. So here's, for example, a compression function that using a smaller primitive. So uh, for me, f will be uh, random n bit to n bit permutation. So that's my smaller primitive. The domain uh, is, um, is over there on the left. It goes from left to right. So this, this domain has, uh, has size uh, uh, 2n, OK? And so there's these XORs, and the, the, the output over there is n bit long. So all the wires on, the, on, the, on this picture have, have length n bits. So if the adversary, um, oh yeah, let me, the adversary makes a query to f, uh, in this case, the adversary is going to learn actually 2 to the n different inputs by making a single query to f, going to learn how to evaluate 2 to the n different inputs. Because for every query it makes to f, that, that red value there it makes to f, there's two to the n different possible input values for the wires that will XOR to that red value. So with one query, it can learn to evaluate two to the n inputs. With two queries, it can learn to evaluate two times two to the n inputs. And, uh, but the total number of outputs is two to the n. So it already has, with just two query, more inputs that it knows how to evaluate than there are outputs. So at a pigeonhole principle, it has collisions. It has a lot of collisions already. Um, so this compression function can be broken in just two queries. So okay, let's let's think about maybe repairing this compression function um, by making doing something more complicated. So I'll replace the XORs by arbitrary functions g1 and g2 that maybe they do some field multiplication or something a little bit weirder and hope for the best. Um, so actually, now that I'm not doing an XOR, I'll I'll move that bottom wire over there. Um, where's the pointer? Okay, yeah, I'll move this bottom wire to the top. So the, the uh, two n bits of input are up there. Um, so again, uh, so for each, uh, each input value is associated to some particular G1 output. And so the set of inputs, the set of all inputs, which I like to draw as an oval, is partitioned into two to the n different families according to their G1 output, according to the value that they map to here. And when I make a query, it's like basically selecting a slice from that oval when I make a specific query to f. So since I have two to the n families and the oval has size uh, two to the two n, uh, the, the average size of a family is two to the n actually, two to the two n divided by two to the n. And so by making one, by choosing the biggest uh, slice in this oval, I can actually learn at least two to the n inputs, right? The biggest slice is size at least two to the n. And by making two such greedy queries, choosing the two biggest slices in the oval, I can learn uh, two times two to the n inputs. So I can also break this uh, compression function as two queries, regardless of what G1 and G2 are. So remember, the adversary's information theoretic, for him, G1 and G2 pose no mystery at all. I mean, they could be horribly complicated for a common mortal, but for the adversary, uh, he can compute pre-images and the sizes of these layers and everything, no problem. So we're never going to prove a good IPM security for a compression function with these parameters. This is what we've learned here. So ideally, when we design a compression function, we like to reach something like birthday security. And what we learn is that sometimes we, we're just not going to get anywhere near birthday security. This is the most general design you could imagine for two n bits to n bits using a single n bit uh, primitive of n bit domain. And you're just never going to get uh, birthday security. So we would like to understand better when can we get birthday security, when can we not. Uh, before discussing the results or the conjectures, I have to define the general model. Um, so here's the general model. So we consider uh, maybe a compression function that calls several different primitives or the same primitive several times. It doesn't matter. So there's different variables involved. So first of all, I, here's s, the, uh, the output length of the, of the compression function. Then I have m plus s over there is the input length. So if this is a compression function, uh, the input length should be bigger than the output length. So m should be some positive integer. And then there's the last variable is the number of times you call a primitive, which is r. And uh, finally, n is the input length of our primitives. We assume all the primitives have the same input length. That's basically the only limitation 
that doesn't make it completely general, is that all the primitives have the same input length. Um, and to, so actually, to make it completely general, I have to, for instance, the function g4 that decides the final output needs the output of f1 and needs the uh, output of f2, so this would make a completely general drawing, and this is what we consider. So we have a conjecture. I mean, there is a conjecture about um, what is the best possible collision resistance of this thing, because we know it's not always birthday. The conjecture is this. So it says the minimum of birthday and this other funny blue term. So, so a factor of r, don't pay any attention to it. Um, this 2 to the s over 2 accounts for a birthday attack. We know we're never going to get better collision security than birthday attack. And, but we know sometimes it's worse. And the conjecture is that it's worse by this funny term over here. If this guy is less than, than this guy, then uh, we're never going to get past this guy. So this was a conjecture by Stam in crypto 2008, I think. Um, and uh, so one thing, uh, so now this is not a conjecture anymore, actually. So this is now a theorem by these uh, illustrious people. Um, so, um, so actually, so let's do an example of this conjecture. So like put in some parameters. So here I chose uh, parameters from a real world uh, compression function, the JH compression function. So it goes from, a, so the input wires over here on the left is 1.5 n bits of input. Every wire on the drawing is length n over 2. 1.5 n bits of input and n bits of output. Um, so S, the output length is, uh, is equal to n. Uh, M, the extra amount of input length is equal to n over 2. There's n over 2 extra bits of input. And R, there's only one call to a primitive. So R equals 1. And Stamps conjecture, or now whatever theorem, uh, would give us the following bound for collision resistance. So there's 2 to the nr, whatever, this funny exponent here. Um, so we compute it, uh, nr, r equals 1, n minus uh, 0 0.5 n. The 0 0.5 n is the m. And uh, the 2 is the r plus 1. And you get 2 to the n over 4, which is less than birthday, right? Birthday would be n over 2 here because the output length is n. So this is a case where it's saying you're never going to get better than you're never going to get to birthday, actually, you're never going to get better than 2 to the n over 4, no matter what you do. And in this particular compression function, indeed, there is a 2 to the n over 4 uh, collision attack. So um, if you look at the compression function a little bit, you'll see that it's enough to find a collision on the top wire. Once you find a collision on the top wire, you're all set. Um, so I find a collision on the top wire by making queries to f. Then I can always adjust the bottom wire using this feed forward XOR to be whatever I want. Uh, I can always adjust the bottom wire to be whatever value I want, and I can just compensate with this value back here. So here it's enough to get a collision on the top wire. The top wire is length n over 2. So it's birthday on n over 2 bits, and this is where this 2 to the n over 4 is coming out. But the conjecture says that no matter what compression function you design with these parameters, this input length, this output length, and one call to an n bit uh, primitive, you're never going to get better than 2 to the n over 4, and that's what we would like to prove. Um, so actually, yeah, I should say something else about this, this picture here. Once we get a collision, uh, we actually get 2 to the n over 2 collisions all at once. Because once I get a collision on the top wire, I can really do whatever I want on the bottom wire. So I can get a collision with a certain value on the bottom wire 0 to the n, value on the bottom wire 1 to the n, whatever I want. And there's 2 to the n over 2 different values I can put here. So once I get one collision, all of a sudden I'm getting like exponentially many collisions. And we also prove in our result, we also prove this phenomenon is always going to happen. So not only at a certain number of queries you're going to get um, a collision, you're going to get actually these exponentially many collisions. So here's the main theorem uh, with this q equals, so some constant term times this, uh, the, the bound of Stam. Uh, we're not going to get just one collision. We're going to get this 2 to the 2 times. Uh, so look at the exponent. It's a funny, it's actually quite cute. Uh, the exponent up here is the difference between the birthday cost and the Stam cost. So when the Stam bound is much lower than the birthday bound, then you get this big threshold phenomenon. So the further the, the Stam bound is beneath the birthday bound, the, the, the more dramatic this threshold is. The more, uh, when you do get a collision, the more suddenly you get like these, these huge number of collisions, okay? This sort of this non-uniformity uh, thing. So I should say one word about uh, how do I count collisions. So normally, the standard way of counting collisions is uh, pairwise. So I just count uh, the number of pairs that collide. Uh, but here, the way we count collisions is um, uh, if I have a function from a domain to a range, the number of collisions is the number of points in the domain that collide with something else in the domain. So here, 
before collisions instead of for choose two. Uh, an elementary observation I can make about this accounting. So this accounting is actually stricter than the pairwise. So this is always a lower bound for pairwise. Pairwise collisions can be much more, okay? So we're being stricter on ourselves by doing this way of counting collisions. Uh, is that this type of, this number of collisions is always bigger than uh, the size of the domain minus the size of the range. So because uh, the number of guys in the domain who don't collide with anything, every guy in the domain who doesn't collide with anything, he takes up, he eats up one element of the range onto himself. So there's only range many such elements in the domain that don't collide with anything. So always we have this elementary lower bound on the number of collisions in a function. Okay. So I described the key lemma now and then on to the proof sketch that uses the key lemma. So here's a function from some finite domain to some finite range. I've cut up the domain into layers like I cut up um, the, my, in one of the first pictures. Um, and so basically the, the lemma says something like this. We're gonna select randomly some number of these layers and the flavor of the lemma is saying that the number of inputs that collide after you've done your selection, so I'm restricting myself to the blue layers, the number of leftover colliding inputs is close to its expectation with high probability. Some kind of thing like that. But so uh, let's actually, that's not so meaningful. Let's actually discuss some numbers. So uh, let's see be the original number of colliding inputs in F. So the original number of, of points in this oval that collide under F, uh, let K be the number of layers in the egg. Um, Q be the number of layers to be randomly selected, so the number of blue layers. Here I have a variable P, which is Q over K, the probability of a layer being selected. So that I have too many variables on the board, I'm gonna take out Q and K and just leave P. Probability of a layer being selected. And uh, so the, so here's, a, I mean, an elementary observation is that the expected number of collisions, I mean, after I do my selection, I can estimate it very roughly as P squared C. So if I'm an element of the domain who's colliding with somebody, then in order to survive and still be a colliding element after the selection process, first of all, my layer has to be selected. I have to be in a blue layer. That happens with probability P. And the person I'm colliding with, his layer or her layer, um, okay, uh, also has to be selected. And that's also with probability P, all right? So this is where this P square is coming in from, all right? So the lemma is basically saying um, that you will get these P square C collisions, but there's a little, there's always a technicality. I mean, you know, these things. So here we need this P square C to be bigger than the largest size of a layer. Uh, if there are very big layers, bad things can happen. So imagine that there's one layer that takes up almost a whole oval. The whole, the whole bubble is taken up by one layer almost. Then everything hinges on whether that layer is selected, okay? So maybe you get no collisions with high, very high probability and just uh, with very low probability an astronomical number of collisions. So you don't want, you want the layers to be sort of like not have too big layers. So once this expectation reaches the size of the largest layer, then this, this lemma is good to go. Um, so now let's do a proof sketch. So we just, uh, stay simple, not do the general case. So for r equals one, I'm gonna prove Stamps bound for this guy. Um, so this is actually the parameters here for this compression function are those of the j hash, the j h I showed before. The, the domain length is 1.5 and the output length is n, one call to an n bit primitive. So this is actually a generalization of j h. We'll show it can never go past a two to the n over four collision resistance. So uh, here's my domain that I like to draw as an oval. Uh, 1.5 n bits. Uh, it is again naturally divided into two to the n over two families or layers according to the G1 value. So every guy up here maps to a certain G1 value. There's two to the possible, two to the n possible uh, G1 outputs. So two to the n layers. So selecting a query to F is like selecting one of these layers basically, same thing. Um, and I note that the average layer size here is um, two to the 1.5n divided by two to the n, two to the n over two. That's my average layer size is two to the n over two. Make simplifying assumption for uh, the talk that each layer actually has size two to the n over two. It's not a big deal assumption. I mean, it's very easy to get to reduce to this actually, but we'll skip that. Um, okay, so the basic game plan is I view this as a compression function for my lemma. Like here's the compression function, the oval with the layer is down to here. I have two to the n over four queries to make. I'm the adversary, I want to win, I want to get a collision. I have two to the n over four queries to make to this f. 
and uh, basic strategy, I have nothing smart to do, I'm just gonna make them randomly. I'm gonna select two to the n over four different random values here and hope to get collisions or maybe even exponentially many collisions, right? So um, here's the blue layers I'm gonna select. So selecting two to the n over four different guys here is like selecting two to the n over four different layers in the egg. Um, so let's, let's do the accounting for the lemma, the various variables that are involved. So first of all, the number of collisions that we start with, okay? The number of collisions that we start with before the selection. So it is domain, size of domain minus size of range. The domain is two to the 1.5 n, the range is tiny, two to the n. Basically everybody's colliding. The domain is so much larger than the range, almost everybody's colliding. So we basically have two to the 1.5 n collisions when we start, okay? Now these, uh, the number of layers is two to the n, uh, the number of queries is two to the n over four. The probability therefore of a layer being queried is two to the minus three fourth n, that's this p. And then the important quantity is p squared c. P squared C, unfortunately, turns out to be two to the zero. Uh, if you look at it, you know, 1.5 and minus three fourths. This one is squared, you know, two to the zero. And this is much less than the max layer size, which is two to the end. And the lemma doesn't apply. The lemma totally breaks down. So actually what's going on is this lemma is very bad when it gives very poor results when the domain is much, much larger than the range and like in this case. So why is the lemma not really giving us what we want? When the domain is much, much larger than the range, a person that's a colliding input in the domain is actually the average colliding input in the domain is colliding with many, many, many other people. And what determines whether that element becomes a colliding input after the selection of blue layers is just whether it gets selected as a blue layer. If its, blue, if its layer gets selected and colored in blue. If that happens, then um, if that happens, then it's colliding with so many other people that it's very, with very high probability one of its buddies is also going to be selected, okay? So this P square is too drastic, okay? It's really more like P. So the lemma is not working, but we can sort of play a trick to reduce to a case where the lemma works. So here's the trick. I'm going to pre-select a ground set inside the oval of two to the n plus one over two layers, and then, so I do that deterministically. I don't make the queries for those. I view that as my new domain, this pink region is my new domain. And then within that, I select my Q layers among those. Okay, so it looks like something stupid, but it's gonna help us. Um, so with this new pink domain, the size of the domain, it turns out to be two to the n plus one. Uh, number of guys times average size of guy two to the n plus one. I selected actually this number of layers so that the new pink domain would be just about the same size as the range. Okay, the range is size two to the n, and this pink domain has size two to the n plus one. So I have a lot of collisions, but it's just a little bit bigger, okay? I don't have bi these big multi-collisions. And now um, we can do the lemma again. So we get two to the n collisions. This is the size of the domain, the pink domain, minus the range, two to the n collisions. This is fewer, this is less than before. We had two to the 1.5 n collisions before. Huh? And then, um, the, the K is, the, so the K has changed, it's, it's smaller, the Q is the same, and the P is now, Q over K has become bigger, two to the minus N over four instead of two to the minus three N over four, because K, the number of sets we're selecting from is smaller. And so P square C has become, actually C has become smaller by a factor two to the N over two, and P has become bigger by a factor two to the N over two, but P is squared, so it's working to our advantage. And we get now P square C is two to the N over two, exactly this max layer size, exactly the condition we need to get the lemma going. Can apply the lemma, we get, um, okay, we're happy, we win. Um, so that's that, I think I'm out of time, and so I'll skip this, but I'll just put it, and, um, and thank you. <laughs>